next speaker is Michael Grady, who is a philosopher of science. Um, in the beginning, <clears throat> I told you how this conference is organized by a new lab called Applied Evolutionary Epistemology. And Michael Grady is one of the founding fathers of evolutionary epistemology. He also sits in the advisory board of our lab, for which I want to thank you very kindly for doing so. Uh, the stairs, yeah. Um, uh, Professor Brady teaches at uh, Ohio at uh, Bowling Green State, and uh, he's going to talk about modeling biocultural evolution. I want to thank Natalie for inviting me here. Uh, I'm a philosopher, so I don't have any empirical data, and I don't do experiments. Uh, but I have some uh, what I call open questions about uh, the whole idea of gene culture evolution that I just want to share with you. Uh, today, um, and I just want to acknowledge my association with uh, the J.P. Scott Center for Neuroscience, Mind, and Behavior at Bowling Green. Um, and basically, I want to raise uh, four or five questions. Uh, first of all, what is the central claim and central aim of gene culture coevolutionary theory? Uh, then I want to look at human knowledge as a bit of culture um, and raise a question about the question about the relevant units of culture. And finally, um, can culture evolve in the absence of organic cultural beings? And strangely, there seems to be a difference of opinion about that. And then I want to talk a little bit about uh, some of uh, the future prospects for this uh, wide program. So, um, what's the central claim and central aim of uh, gene culture coevolutionary theory? Um, reading through the recent literature, it's hard to get a handle on one central idea, but one thing that keeps uh, cropping up is the idea uh, that the central aim appears to be the goal of Darwinizing culture. And uh, there are two problematic terms in this uh, goal. One is uh, what is culture, and the other is uh, what exactly do we mean by uh, Darwinizing something. So what is culture? Well, there's lots of variation here. Um, borrowing a sort of an older uh, characterization by uh, Huxley in 1955, which seems to be consistent with a lot of the modern uh, views that uh, culture basically consists of the self-reproducing -rep or reproducible products of the mental activities of a group of human individuals living in a society. Some variation on that, I think, covers a lot of the contemporary understanding. But what does it mean, then, to Darwinize culture? And I presume that the, what this means is the attempt to uh, model cultural change as a Darwinian process. Um, but what exactly does that involve, and what's the motivation behind it? And one of the underlying motivations for Darwinizing culture, uh, apparently, is the desire to unify the human sciences in the same way that uh, Darwin's theory of evolution was later subsequently said to um, unify the biological sciences. So consider as a parallel Darwin's theory of evolution by means of natural selection and common descent. Uh, there were well-established empirical observations about biotic diversity and systematics that were si cried out for some explanation. These are the data that uh, Darwin uh, laid out in The Origin of Species. And my question is basically, what, what are the relevant cultural analogs to this set of data? First question. And secondly, what is Darwinian evolution? Well, is it just evolution by natural selection, or is it evolution by natural selection plus common descent? If it's the latter, then cultural change uh, might not qualify as Darwinian insofar as multiple independent innovation or innovation events are discoverable in the literature. Just a simple example, uh, Darwin and Wallace uh, both came to the same idea at roughly the same time. Uh, Darwin uh, 10 or 20 years earlier, but 
never published until he got the letter from Wallace. And one might think that there's a common ancestral element to their theories to be located in the bizarre uh, accidental or coincidental fact that both were inspired by reading Malthus's essay on population. But is either man's theory, except in a very metaphorical sense, a descendant of Malthusian doctrine, or were they really uh, separate, separate innovation events? And more generally, as I've been thinking about this, and I'm just beginning really to think about the idea of cultural evolution, um, are Darwinian, or for that matter, any evolutionary models good at representations of cultural change? And so I think it's important, as some people have pointed out, to recognize the distinction between change on the one hand and evolutionary change on the other. Um, that the biota of the planet has changed over time in terms of the number of representative organisms and patterns of diversity, I take that as an uncontroversial fact. Similarly, there's documentary archeological and anthropological evidence that establishes the fact that cultures and societies have changed over time in terms of representative structures and patterns of behavior. So they're similar in that respect. One very successful approach to understanding and explaining the patterns of biological change has been what we might call the general Darwinian evolutionary paradigm. These general features were developed by Darwin and subsequent advances in genetics, molecular biology, and other fields have filled in the details on how this Darwinian process works. I'm a little more suspicious about the prospects of a similarly successful evolutionary approach to cultural and social change, which uh, the prospects, at least from my perspective at this point, seem um, much dimmer in general. But more specifically, I want to take a look at human knowledge as a bit of culture. And um, too long ago than I want to remember, I conceived of this distinction between what I called at the time evolution of epistemic mechanisms, the EEM program, and tried to distinguish that from the EET program or the evolution of epistemic theses or the evolution of knowledge content would have been a better way to put it. Um, the basic idea was simple. In order to uh, generate knowledge or create culture, a certain degree of neural sophistication is required. And given a broadly Darwinian uh, view of the emergence of cultural creatures, this capacity must have evolved, although we remain ignorant oops, sorry, of the details of how this might have occurred. But the general pattern seems to be uh, consistent with the evolution of other uh, biological organs, for example. On the other hand, once the capacity to create culture has evolved, at least to me, it's no, lo not, not, no longer so obvious that the produced contents of the products of this cultural capacity are also properly modeled as a Darwinian process. Uh, Don Campbell and Karl Popper, who are the true intellectual founders of this evolutionary epistemology discipline, they're the classical defenders of the view that it's a Darwin all the way through. Darwin for the Darwinizing the development of the capacity for culture and Darwinizing uh, the evolution of the cultural contents as well. But um, I've been, one of the reasons I made this distinction in the first place was because I was convinced by the evolution of the genetic mechanisms for producing culture which was a Darwinian process, but not so convinced about the uh, Darwinian evolutionary prospects for the second. OK. Now I want to ask a question about the relevant units of culture. Uh, one suggestion has been that uh, the relevant analog to the, uh, gen the gene as the unit of biological evolution is uh, something that uh, Dawkins called memes. And what I want to ask uh, basically are, what's the predictive value of these mimetic models of cultural or social change on the one hand, 
And finally, uh, do we really need memes? Now, what's, what about the predictive value? Um, a Darwinian approach to biological evolution, for example, predicts that once we've discovered the genetic mechanisms underlying reproduction, all biological organisms ought to share the same mechanism and a more or less universal genetic code. If we were to discover a significant group of organisms with a different genetic code, that would force us, at the very least, to rethink our understanding of the evolutionary history of life on the planet. My question, I don't know the answer, are there any com comparable falsifiable predictions that would lead to a radical revision of our understanding of social and cultural history? And with no information at all, I suspect not, but <laughs> who am I to say? What about do we need something like memes or some universal unit of culture? Uh, Susan Blackmore, who's been a defender of the various memetic proposals, has suggested that uh, we do need memes, that, that's a necessary unit. Um, but what exactly do we gain by introducing the concept of meme in characterizing or characterizations of cultural change? Does the appeal to memes explain anything, or does it merely redescribe the phenomena of interest? Given cultural variance and given their changing relative frequencies over time, we can identify the successful variants and reasonably ask why these variants and not the other competitors. Introducing memes, at least from my point of view, merely redescribes the process using a new vocabulary. Nothing is explained that wasn't explained by other memes. Contrast this situation with the effect of introducing a gene story to accounts of biological evolution. For example, Charles Darwin, who knew nothing about genes and was confused about inheritance, appealed to the observed diversity of organic beings and the hierarchical structure of the systematic classification of organisms to support his argument that these data could best be explained by the theory of natural selection and common descent. He had no true clue about the true nature of inheritance at the time, but when a genetic layer was added to the story, this was not a mere redescription of the obvious, but added or provided an explanatory mechanism that not only bolstered the original Darwinian story, but also had novel predictive import as well. So I'm suggesting that the, the Darwinian story of biological evolution has supplemented with uh, genetic theory, has an explanatory power that understanding cultural change laden over with a meme story does not. And so finally, so I, I'm, I'm sort of suspicious of uh, Blackmore's claim that, that uh, mimetic stories add any significant understanding to our theories or our understanding of cultural change. Can culture evolve in the absence of organic cultural beings? And uh, here it turns out, I discovered to my surprise, there's a disagreement depending on whether you identify culture as a brain-centered activity or as an artifact-centered art activity. Clearly, if one thinks that changes in culture must be filtered through living brains, then if there are no living brains, no cultural change can take place. However, Susan Blackmore again has suggested that culture and the evolution of change in culture does not require organic agents. She suggests that once cultural memes emerge, they begin to evolve in a way that's decoupled from the evolution of organic beings. The emergence of cyber culture and autonomic search engines are a possible realization of this view. And also don't forget uh, that Karl Popper, a proponent of a synoptic view of the scope of evolutionary epistemology, was sympathetic to the idea that human knowledge was a product analogous 
to birds' nests, for example, and had a substantial existence independent of the humans who developed it. This is the famous world one, world two, world three is where objective knowledge lies. Right? This view was developed in a classic a paper, uh, knowledge, without a hum knowledge Without a Knowing Subject, uh, which uh, annoys my philosophy students every time I, I give them this because they're used to thinking that knowing requires believing and believing requires believers and so on. But I'm sympathetic to this Papirian point. Unlike bird nests, which once constructed don't have the capacity to modify themselves, human knowledge can be processed and massaged by artificial intelligent devices, which although of, as of now need to be initiated by human agents, can in principle continue to operate in the absence of human intervention, and hence could produce novel knowledge in the absence of organic agents. Uh, now, one caveat here has to be, if you recall, in Popper's model, the third world, the third world contained not only objective knowledge, but also objective ignorance. So even false hypotheses lived in this uh, sort of platonic realm of uh, objective knowledge. And if that's true, then um, the failed hypotheses are denizens of the third world as well as uh, supported or confirmed hypotheses. That raises the question of what the selection pressures on these third world entities might be. So understanding, if you want to understand cultural change, in particular uh, the evolution of human knowledge or changes in human knowledge, then you have to give an account, it seems to me, of what the interactive selective environment is like. And my view that uh, I don't really go into here is that uh, that selective environment is a data environment, not a real world environment. And data, um, as everybody should recognize, is not something that you find on the beach. It's something you construct on the basis of your interactions with the world. And so it's got a ineradicable social dimension to it, how to sort all that out. I leave that to the empirical scientists among us. So the point is, that although I'm suspicious of Blackmore's thesis that appeals to memes have explanatory force, I am sympathetic to her view that culture as embodied in artifacts is capable, or cultural products as embodied in artifacts are capable of change. Now, whether that's evolutionary or not, uh, in the absence of organic embrained agents. And here, I'm just emphasizing that it seems to me that when people talk about the evolution of culture, you have to be very specific about what you mean by the difference between things that just change on the one hand and things which are somehow involved in an evolutionary process properly, properly understood. OK, finally. Um, some prospects and open questions. And here, um, the art of prophecy, as this is an old saying, right, is very difficult, especially with respect to the future. Um, nevertheless, I'm going to creep in here where angels fear to tread, mindful of Ambrose Bierce's definition of prophecy as the art and practice of selling one's credibility for future delivery. So. Um, is the alleged Darwinian character of cultural change mere metaphor or more? And I emphasize the mere here, not the metaphor, because I'm very supportive of the idea that metaphors not only have uh, pedagogic power, uh, but also explanatory power as well. So I'm not claiming that a metaphorical account is non-explanatory, but a mere metaphor is just a suggestive analogy which has no uh, necessary explanatory content. And it seems to me that people who want to argue for a Darwinian uh, evolutionary explanation of cultural change are um, committed to or should produce a, an account of, in cultural terms, of what that Darwinian uh, process really looks like. 
Secondly, with respect to the question of memes, if appealing to memes is not a useful uh, tool, are there fundamental units of culture um, analogous in some sense to genes? And here I don't know the answer. I don't have a general thesis. I mean, it doesn't appear that there is an analog, a, a suitable explanatory analog to genes, but um, who am I to foreclose on what some uh, ingenious inventor might discover or invent? Thirdly, again, just reemphasizing this point, does culture evolve in the sense of having an evolutionary dynamic, or is it merely changing? And it seems to me you can't just point to uh, changes in cultures or changes in social behaviors or practices and claim uh, that some kind of evolution is going on there, at least some kind of evolution more than mere change. Um, fourthly, uh, this is a question I really have no good answer to. Um, suppose we're confronted with uh, uh, alternative scenarios of particular examples of cultural change. How are we supposed to decide, distinguish between the good scenarios and the bad ones? In, in the experimental sciences um, or in the, in the other empirical scientists like biology, for example, um, presumably you can tell, distinguish a good evolutionary hypothesis from a bad one because it makes predictions that can be verified and falsified. Is that possible with these evolutionary models of cultural change? I don't know. Finally, uh, is a unified theory of social change, Darwinian or otherwise, um, that plays a role analogous to the role proposed by Simpson for evolutionary biology even possible? And remember, Simpson's idea was that once uh, we understood the implications of Darwinian evolution, nothing in biology made sense except in the light of evolution. Is it similarly true that there's some cultural evolutionary theory such that nothing in culture makes sense in the absence of this uh, cultural ep evolutionary dynamic? Um, I don't know. I think that's a hard question. And that's it. Here's some references. You can't see.